Sometime in the 1840s, while en route to his home in Iowa, John Plum Jr. stopped in the newly incorporated city of Chicago and took this photograph. Facing southwest, he was looking at the State Street Slough, just south of State and Madison. One of the earliest photographs ever taken in Chicago captures the most important element of its history, that the city sprang up almost overnight. New York, Boston, Philadelphia grew slowly over centuries. Detroit, St. Louis were established cities, while Chicago was still a marshy outpost, attracting only a handful of fur traders. I entered Chicago in 1836. Everything was new then. It was thick with Indians, some French, and a few Americans, but they scattered. The best man wouldn't take a farm in the center of Chicago if you gave it to him. Benjamin Hill. But a confluence of events and inventions, most importantly the expansion of the railroad, transformed this mosquito-infested swamp into one of the world's most influential cities. Every aspect of its history, from engineering to architecture, from crime to politics, is related to that rapid growth. And unlike other boom towns, its progress continued unabated. For the last four decades of the 19th century, Chicago was the fastest growing city on earth. As the population swelled, the city inevitably fanned out. And that included cutting into the seemingly impenetrable forest that once shrouded the North Shore. The logical place to start was to follow the ancient narrow paths the Indians had hewn through the dense woods as they traveled to and from a trading post in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Congress designated the Green Bay Indian Trail a post road in 1832 commencing mail service between Fort Dearborn in Chicago and Fort Howard in Green Bay. The first people to venture into the North Shore after the Indians were mail runners. These early postal workers took their lives into their hands as they made the 500-mile trek on foot, the path being too hazardous for horses. They were expected to live off the land and carried a heavy mountaineer's rifle to shoot game, a powder horn, a pouch of bullets, a sheath knife, a pair of pistols, a hatchet, a bedroll, a blanket, an emergency reserve of parched corn, and of course, a heavy sack of mail. When they could, they stayed in Indian villages. More often they spent cold nights alone, hungry, huddled under a blanket by a small fire. Wolves sometimes encircled them, keeping them awake all night. A letter between the two cities took one month, assuming it got there at all. Several mail runners were killed by hostile Indians, angry about the influx of white immigrants. One hapless carrier lost his life to the cold. His feet were frostbitten and had to be amputated. In what would become the first surgical procedure ever performed in Chicago, the doctor used rusty instruments, which led to an infection that killed him. Mail runners longed for summer when they could deliver their charge by boat. In Winnetka, starting from the north, the Green Bay Trail skirted around the ravines following Old Green Bay Road, then Tower, then Sheridan. At Maple Street, the trail split into a dry and wet trail. The dry trail, or summer trail, continued along the lake. But the main route followed Maple, then Church Street, and finally Ridge Avenue, where it continued on to Chicago. This small intersection at Maple Street Beach is, in fact, centuries old. The Indians naturally chose higher ground. It was drier and offered a better vantage to spy approaching enemies. To the west, the dense woods opened up to what they called the Chiwab Skokie, meaning the Swamp Prairie. Before the man-made lagoons and forest preserves, the Skokie was an uninhabitable marsh, rich in wildlife, 
known for its mysterious sinkholes, self-igniting peat fires, and terrible flooding. The dark thicket of trees on the right, rising above the Skokie Marsh, was a haunt for crows. So it was called the Crow Island Woods. A high ridge, far on the other side of the Swamp Prairie, was another major Indian route. We know it today as Waukegan Road. To navigate through the thick woods along the shore, the Indians created markers by bending young white oak trees, usually pointing them toward the lake. These Indian trail trees, once so common, became the symbol of Winnetka. But as one by one the trees died and fell apart, so also the memory of those who bent them has faded away. Indian weapons found all along the North Shore, three to six miles from the beach, indicate that the area had been the scene of numerous bloody battles. But it was the Black Hawk War of 1832 that spelled the end of Indian domination in Illinois and Wisconsin. Chief Black Hawk, in retaliation for being robbed of his land, led 2,000 warriors in an all-out war against white settlers in the Midwest. The federal government responded with full force, quelling the uprising within months. Even young Abraham Lincoln enlisted in the war, though as he put it, the only action he saw was fighting mosquitoes. Black Hawk was captured, arrested, and sent east, where he languished in a New Jersey prison. His defeat enabled the whites to pressure the Indians to sign a number of dubious treaties, including the Treaty of Chicago, which banished them west of the Mississippi. The chiefs dreaded signing the document, avoiding it for months. It was not until white officers got them completely drunk that they finally put their marks down on paper. When I consider the miserly amounts paid for the land, the use of whiskey, and the cheap, gaudy wares dangled before his eyes that tempted him to part with his birthright, every honest man must feel shame that some of our land came to us through such means. Viola Reeling. The Treaty of Chicago was signed in 1833, but it would be several more years before the Indians actually packed up and left. Young men who fought in the Black Hawk War of 1832 returned east with glowing reports of Illinois' rich soil, rousing a great migration to what was then called the Northwest. In 1836, seven families left their farms in Vermont to start a new life here. Arriving in Chicago in mid-August, the caravan continued northwest, where it's believed they founded the town of Woodstock. But one family, Erastus and Zerna Patterson and their five children split off from the group and headed straight north up the Green Bay Trail. Late that afternoon, they arrived at the hill where Lloyd Beach is today. Between Chicago and Winnetka, they passed only four houses. Erastus concluded this would be an ideal spot to build a tavern for weary travelers. They squatted the land, constructing a one-and-a-half-story log cabin, which they called the Wayside Inn. Their timing was perfect. The federal government opened stagecoach lines between Chicago and Milwaukee, including the Green Bay Post Road. Trees were blazed, the trail widened, and travelers began exploring the North Shore in what became known as the Era of the Tavern. We usually found taverns about 15 miles apart. They're all built of logs and strongly indicate the haste that is the pervading spirit of Illinois. The rich soil around them forms beds of mud which is trodden in and around the house without the slightest regard to comfort or cleanliness. Ellen Bigelow. At breakfast, there were a very large party who occupied two tables and exhibited the usual American speed of eating and drinking. No change of knife or fork or plate, no spoon for the sugar basin, no ceremony whatsoever observed. Every man for himself and none for his neighbor, hurrying, snatching, gulping like famished wildcats, victuals disappearing like magic. <laughs> 
James Logan. But that first year would put Mrs. Patterson to the test. When a mother and daughter arrived from England, a series of mysterious deaths followed. No sooner had they checked into the tavern when the woman suddenly fell ill and died. She needed to be buried immediately. Erastus chose a spot across the road. Then the woman's daughter fell ill and died. Erastus buried her beside her mother. Then Erastus fell ill and died. 42-year-old Zerna Patterson found herself in a strange land, running a tavern, raising her five children alone. She'd remain here for the rest of her life, becoming Winnetka's first permanent resident. She would live to see the 20th century. This is Sheridan Road in 1870, looking north from Maple toward the hill. The Patterson Tavern is hidden in the trees on the right. Here we see the same spot today. The tavern was located immediately north of the drive entering Lloyd Beach. The large open spaces in this 1897 photograph revealed decades of deforestation, the trees having been used for housing and fuel. For the next 15 years, a small handful of pioneers settled in the area that would become Winnetka. German immigrant Peter Schmidt moved his family into this log house at the southern edge of Winnetka, built on a high hill overlooking the whole region. When construction workers leveled that hill for a new country club in 1911, bulldozers unearthed the remains of an ancient Potawatomi village. The country club, originally slated to be called Saganash, was renamed simply Indian Hill. Irish immigrant Simon Doyle built this cabin on the lake just south of what is today Centennial Park. Wilmette's daughter, Elizabeth, married here in what would be Winnetka's first wedding. They would divorce four years later. A German named Wendell Alice received a land grant for 160 acres along Winnetka's southern border. His property line created Hill Road. Irishman Thomas Dwyer built a cabin just north of the Patterson Tavern. Anson Taylor and his wife Eliza moved to the north end of Winnetka, above Tower Road along the lake. Taylor had served in the Black Hawk War under General Winfield Scott. While stationed at the second Fort Dearborn, he and his brother built the first bridge spanning the Chicago River. The river was crystal clear then, as was the lake. Anson Taylor. Taylor hated crowds, and when Chicago's population exceeded a thousand, he decided it was time to move. To transport his belongings north, he built a scow or flat-bottomed boat, which was pulled along the shore by oxen walking on the beach. It took two days to reach Winnetka. Taylor decided to start his own tavern, so he moved a little further north, becoming the first settler in what is now Glencoe. At Harbor Street, he built a pier, a lighthouse, and a tavern called the Pier House. It became known as Taylor's Port. The price Taylor paid for 160 acres of prime lakefront property, $189.94. German immigrant John Happ arrived in 1843. He and his son built a blacksmith shop on the Green Bay Trail. To reach the shop, farmers coming in from the country cut a straight path through the woods. The path would eventually become Elm Street. The shop was located about where the Hadley School for the Blind is today. Like the other Germans before him, Hap was part of a larger migration from Trier, Germany. When Cook County divided into townships in 1849, it was John Hap who suggested the name. It was almost called Patterson Township, until Zerna nixed the idea. Of all the early pioneers, perhaps the most influential was a Brit named John Garland. Over six feet tall, heavy set, and jovial, Garland was planning on moving his family to Wisconsin. Getting a late start, he and his wife Susanna and their eight children arrived at the wayside after dark. The old tavern was made of crude logs cut from the woods roundabout. It was quite a large and rambling place. 
my father and my brother slept in the loft. Sue Garland. In the morning, Garland was struck by the beauty of the area. He went for a long walk. The more he saw, the more he liked. And the more convinced he became they should go no further. When he returned to the tavern, he bought it. He purchased most of the surrounding land, which became known as Garland's Woods. His influence would extend well into the 20th century. Garland established an important precedent. He was the first resident of considerable wealth. By mid-century, Winnetka was still an untamed wilderness, a handful of brave immigrants living along two branches of the muddy Indian trails, surrounded by primitive forest. If a traveler stepped into the Wayside Inn in 1850 and asked where he was, the answer would have been New Trier. That was about to change. Charles Peck was 20 years old when he arrived in Chicago in 1836. He was intelligent, idealistic, industrious, and above all energetic, having walked much of the way from Vermont. When I arrived in Chicago... It was no unusual sight to see Indians wandering about the streets. We never had any trouble with them. They didn't have to go any further than Chicago Avenue to find plenty of game. So primitive was Chicago in those days that packs of wolves prowled the streets, killing dogs and cats and livestock. The city organized several exterminating parties. Business was suspended and the whole town took a holiday. Hundreds of wolves were driven out onto the ice that formed along the lakefront, where they were shot and thrown into the water. Peck tried his hand at a number of jobs. He became a fireman, then a fire chief, a lieutenant in the Illinois militia, a juror, a judge. I was a member of the first jury to condemn anyone to be hanged in Cook County. John Stone murdered Lucretia Thompson in the big woods on the west side and created a great deal of indignation at the time. Stone was escorted to the gallows by the judge and jury that convicted him. The hanging was made a general holiday. Almost every person in Chicago, men, women, and children, turned out to witness the affair. Early Chicago was a city of horses. They made the economy tick. The need for saddles, harnesses, reins, and other leather goods seemed endless. When Peck started a hide and leather shop on Lake Street, he struck it rich. So much so, he was able to retire a wealthy man at age 38. He had married Sarah Russ, and they had two girls. Peck longed to raise them out in the country, away from Chicago's squalor. In 1854, they purchased a farm 15 miles north of the city from a man named Erastus Bowen, who had bought it from Zerna Patterson. Shortly afterward, they conceived the idea of dividing the farm into square blocks and inviting their rich Chicago friends to move there. It was the birth of Winnetka as we know it. The couple's friends assumed the Pecks would name the town after themselves, Peck Town or Peckville. But Sarah hated the idea and came up with the name Winnetka. When asked what in the world Winnetka meant, she said she'd come across the word in a book. It was an Indian phrase meaning beautiful land. James L. Wilson was the first to take them up on the offer. He and his wife Mary built this home on Maple Street, between Ash and Cherry. It was the first house built in the newly platted town of Winnetka. Artemis Carter was next. He built this mansion on the lake between Elm and Oak. It would later become the Hoyt Mansion and was located in the very middle of what is today Hoyt Lane. The stone pillars marking the driveway entrance are all that remain of the old estate. 
Carter would become the first village president and play a key role in developing Winnetka's early school system. More friends arrived. Their friends attended the same Unitarian church. They believed in temperance, they were abolitionists, they put a strong emphasis on the importance of education, and all members of the new Republican Party. The Pecks started the first school here. It met in a private home on Elm and Sheridan, seen here, and consisted of 17 pupils taught by a 15-year-old teacher. Later, the Pecks built the first public schoolhouse on the northwest corner of what is today the Village Green. The building also served as the town's first church. Peck didn't sell lots or even acres, but entire square blocks. His own home, dubbed Peck's Place, took up 11 acres from Elm to Pine, Lincoln to Maple. Peck believed Winnetka's glory was its trees, and he planted over 100 varieties of new trees on his property. It became an arboretum and tourist attraction. Homes were no longer fashioned from the surrounding woods. Lumber was shipped in. A huge lumber pier was built at the foot of Willow Road. We boys always went down to the lake after big storms looking for lumber. The moorings on the freighters sometimes slipped and the lumber washed ashore. It was all clear white pine from Michigan without a knot in it. George Dealey. Peck commissioned the planting of hundreds of elms on Elm Street from the town to the lake. Most of the original trees have been lost. First when the road was widened, later to Dutch elm disease. When the village incorporated in 1869, the first charter included a provision protecting Winnetka's trees from harm. The first charter also banned horse racing on Winnetka's streets. But for all of Charles Peck's foresight and contributions, it was a business arrangement with Walter Gurney that would have the greatest impact on Winnetka's future. On the morning of December 19, 1854, 100 people left the warmth and comfort of their homes, trudged through the snow and stood beside an open air shed just north of Elm Street. It was the entire population of Winnetka. The day was chilly and overcast, and they stomped about to keep warm. There were no shops yet, few streets, just dense forest all around them. At about 10.30, the crowd faced south to see what they were waiting for. The first train pulling into Winnetka. When the Chicago and Milwaukee Railroad laid tracks as far as Waukegan, they inaugurated service with a promotional car. Making only five stops, Winnetka coming right after Evanston, the one-way trip took two and a half hours. In order for the train to make the steep grade up to town, it was necessary to build a trestle between Indian Hill and Winnetka, seen here. Initially, the railroad laid only one track, so turntables were built all along the line. This one was at Spruce Street. To send the train back to Chicago, the engine car was wheeled around this platform by hand. The idea of commuting to work in Chicago by rail was the brainchild of one man, Walter S. Gurney. Gurney had come to Chicago not to make his fortune, but to expand the one he already had. As head of the Chicago Hide and Leather Company, where it's presumed he met Charles Peck, he made a fortune. He was elected mayor twice, Democrat. After failing to win a third term in a bitterly fought contest, he became president of the c &M Railroad. Gurney has been called the father of the North Shore, and for good reason. Once he knew where the tracks were to be laid, he bought up all the available land around them. He shared title with Charles Peck for all his Winnetka holdings. The men supervised the platting of the town, creating many of the streets we know today. Gurney also acquired much of the land that would become Glencoe, Highland Park, and Lake Bluff as well. 
When the first train pulled into Winnetka on that blustery December morning, the Indians had been gone less than 15 years. There was not a single paved road here, no sidewalks, no street lamps, kerosene or otherwise. Electricity was a half century away, as was the telephone. Winnetka had no plumbing. People dug wells. There was no sanitation. Homes had outhouses. There were no shops downtown. There was no downtown. But in selecting Winnetka as a train stop, Gurney secured its future. For if he could father suburbs, he could kill them too. Anson Taylor petitioned for a train stop in Taylorsport. Gurney turned him down. Gurney had just purchased a 12,000 acre farm due north of Taylorsport, with the intent of developing a new town there. Having fond memories of his childhood in Glencoe, Scotland, he borrowed the name. He built a large castle for himself, meticulously landscaped as a kind of advertisement for the town. And he made sure the train stopped directly in front of it. At the time, Taylorsport was a much more established town than either Winnetka or Glencoe, but in denying it a train stop, Gurney effectively killed it. Gurney did the same with Port Clinton. It was too close to his land holdings in what would become Highland Park. When he denied it a train stop, Port Clinton died. He tried to kill Lake Forest, too. A group of Presbyterians requested a stop for their new town in 1856. Gurney said no. It was too close to his land in Lake Bluff, then called Rockland. Needless to say, Lake Forest survived his initial snub. Not everyone was happy with the train. Travel along the Federal Road dried up, bringing an abrupt end to the era of the tavern. John Happ packed up his livery and moved to a farm west of town becoming one of the pioneers of Northfield. Many farmers, convinced the sparks from the engine would burn their farms to the ground, also packed up and left. Management at CNM, however, did not share Gurney's vision of railroad suburbs. In truth, the tracks were not laid for commuter trains, but for freight. Whether he was asked to step down or he chose to resign, we don't know. But Gurney's tenure at the railroad was short-lived. It was not until the following year that the railroad tentatively experimented with passenger service by adding what was called an accommodation car to the freight. As commuter profits soared, it was freight that lost out. Meanwhile, Gurney continued his land speculation from his Glencoe mansion, but he overextended himself, and when the Civil War broke out, he declared bankruptcy. He sold Charles Peck his half of their Winnetka holdings before returning to his home state of New York where he later died of pneumonia. His old castle still stands today, in sight of the tracks he helped build. Long after Gurney left Illinois, the railroad named a new depot in Warren Township after him. Eventually, a town grew up around the depot, adopting the name. Of the thousands of visitors to Gurney's many outlet malls or Great America, few have any idea that Walter Gurney was the one man who, more than any other, envisioned Chicago's railroad suburbs. Of all the places in early Winnetka, none was more entrancing than this, Edwin Walker. Three years after Charles and Sarah Peck founded Winnetka, Jared Gage purchased the entire northern section of the village. It was a dense woods extending all the way from the Skokie to the lake, so he named it Lakeside. It was the railroad 50 years later that would change the name to Hubbard Woods. Too many lakesides, they said. This is Green Bay Road in Hubbard Woods at the turn of the century, looking south from Scott toward the park. Here we see the same spot today, 
Jared Gage was a country school teacher in upstate New York when he and his two brothers headed west to seek their fortune. They founded Gage's Lake, just west of Gurnee. But Jared's talent for business soon drew him to the city. With his nephew, John Haynes, future mayor of Chicago, he started a highly successful flour mill. The men also formed one of the city's first banks, Fidelity Savings. Chicago was good to Jared Gage, but the devout Presbyterian worried that the city's plethora of saloons, brothels, and opium dens would corrupt his children. His older brother John had moved to Wilmette. John purchased 120 acres on the lake, including what is today Plaza del Lago. This is Gage's Beach in Wilmette, where the high-rise buildings now stand. So Jared followed his brother north. Naming the streets was not one of my grandfather's greater talents. In laying out the lots and streets in Lakeside, he named them George and Frank after his sons. They were later renamed Asbury and Scott. Our grandmother's maiden name, Merrill, and our own survived. Jesse Gage Danley. Jared Gage contributed generously to Winnetka's future, giving money for the first library and Academy Hall. He secured a train stop for Lakeside, paying for the construction of its depot. For his family, he built this elegant 20-room mansion on the lake. He and his brothers helped found Lake Forest Academy, where Jared sent his son. But Jared Gage lost everything. After the Chicago fire, the city was being rebuilt on credit. Two years later, a financial panic triggered a nationwide depression. The combination caused the Fidelity Savings Bank to collapse. Gage was determined that no one who would put their money in his bank would lose their investment. He turned to his partner and nephew for help. But Haynes had hid his money in his wife's account. If Gage wanted to pay them back, it would have to come out of his own pocket. Jared Gage sold everything he owned, his land, his house, and all his possessions, until each deposit was returned in full. He sold his house to Robert Scott, founder of the Carson Peary Scott Department Store. He's seen here on the property. He sold the land to Gilbert Hubbard, for whom Hubbard Woods is named. Hubbard was one of a number of prominent citizens who moved to Winnetka after the Chicago fire. Hubbard bought land beside the home of his brother-in-law, Artemis Carter. Before he could build on it, though, he discovered some unexpected squatters. Russell Carter took us out to see the parcel of land just north of his place. The bank was covered with wigwams and teepees. Indian canoes were parked all along the shore. We didn't go down to the beach, but stayed on the bluff up above. Eventually, the Indians were told to move so they could commence building a house there, which they did. I don't know where they struck out for. It was fine with me. They were a vengeful people. By then, they were just great beggars. That was the last Indian encampment in Winnetka. Johnny Burns. Hubbard built this house on the bluff, just north of Elm Street. Grandfather liquidated completely. Earlier, Jared Gage had given his children four small houses on Scott Avenue, just east of the tracks, at the time still part of Taylorsport. Near Penniless, he and his wife moved into the smallest house, the one closest to the tracks. Seven years later, Jared Gage died a poor man. Grandfather's was a fortune honestly earned and honestly spent. Jesse Gage Danley. Shortly after Gage had first arrived in the village, his beautiful lakeside estate witnessed the most heartbreaking event in Winnetka's history. The worst maritime disaster to ever take place out on Lake Michigan happened off the shores of Winnetka. The year was 1860 and Chicago was playing a pivotal role in presidential politics. It was here that the newly formed Republican Party had just nominated Abraham Lincoln. 
The Democrats were holding a campaign rally for their candidate, Lincoln's old nemesis, Stephen A. Douglas. On Friday, September 7th, hundreds of Irish Democrats from Milwaukee rode the sleek steamer, the Lady Elgin, down to Chicago. After a jam-packed day of parades, rallies, dinners, and speeches, the rowdy group boarded the boat for the return trip. A stiff wind was blowing from the south. The captain's fear of a storm was overruled by the passengers' anxiety to get home. The exact number of passengers has never been determined since all records were lost, and a large number of men boarded the ship at the last minute without tickets. Estimates range anywhere from 500 to 700 people. The boat was densely packed and overcrowded. Staterooms double booked. People slept on floors and hallways, on benches, Young men snuck into the cargo hold where they slept on flour sacks and feed bags. Hundreds of others, animated by the rally, took to the dance floor where the German band played into the night. All of them were unaware that a full-blown September thunderstorm was bearing down on them from the northeast. Something within me said, don't go. I asked my husband to return by rail. He argued with me and insisted that we should get on the boat. Margaret Burke. The ship left port around midnight. It had been a hot, muggy day, and Captain Jack Wilson ordered the ship deep into the lake where the air was cool. Two hours later, the ship was approximately 12 miles off Highland Park. Heading in the opposite direction was a lumber schooner named the Augusta, the two ships spotted each other at 2 a.m., a half mile apart. Then the thunderstorm hit. The temperature plunged as thunderclouds released a torrential rain. Gale force winds churned the lake into a torrent. Suddenly, a huge wave shifted the lumber on the Augusta's deck, almost sinking her. The schooner was on its side, the crew struggling to control her. Captain Mallet of the Augusta realized they were heading straight for the steamer. He screamed for them to turn. At 2.30 a.m., the Augusta rammed the Lady Elgin, cutting a huge gash in her hull on the port side, forward of the paddle wheel. The two boats were momentarily locked together, during which the Augusta did more damage, prying open the side wheel planking. Her jib boom ran through the pond tree and cut her down to the keelson so that the dishes, ponds, and plates were on the schooner's deck. I could have stepped from one vessel to the other. After a few minutes, a wave separated them. The Augusta waited to see if the Lady Elgin needed help. Unable to hear a response to their calls, the crew continued on to Chicago, fearing for their own safety. They even ripped the name board off the Augusta and tossed it into the lake to be identified later. Everyone on board the Elgin had felt the jolt. The chandeliers were all broken and destroyed, and the women were crying. As my husband opened the door of our cabin, we saw chairs and tables jumping from side to side. Captain Wilson had been sleeping in his cabin when the crash snapped him awake. He ran to the engine room. Water was gushing in. No one could see how big the hole was for all the water. He ran to the pilot house. First mate George Davis had already commanded the ship head straight for shore. The captain quietly confided in Davis that the Elgin was doomed. Then he ordered Davis and a dozen other men into a lifeboat so they could try and plug the leak from the outside with mattresses and bedding. Amazingly, there were no oars in the lifeboat. A crew member tossed them a single oar just before it disappeared into the darkness at the mercy of the wind. The captain shouted over and over, all hands on deck, all hands on deck. Within five or 10 minutes, the lifeboats were filled and lowered, but the heavy sea running after the storm swamped them all. Most lifeboats were overturned or submerged by huge waves. In the hull were 70 head of cattle, longhorn steer used as ballast. The captain ordered them driven out into the lake to lighten the ship. Instead, the whole ship lowered into the rolling sea. Panic set in. People began tearing the ship apart. They ripped doors off their hinges, pulled up floorboards, anything that would float. People were crazed, shrieking and crying and praying. The confusion on the boat is indescribable. Men, women and children running everywhere crying. I resigned myself to the will of God and prayed fervently that if it was his holy will that I should be lost, he would save my immortal soul. 
A large number of passengers were trapped in the lower decks by flooding. Men wielded axes to free them. Survivors recalled the haunting cacophony, the helpless cries, howling wind, thunder, pelting rain, axes smashing wood, the clanging bell, and above it all, the mournful hissing of the steam whistle as the ship dipped in and out of the water. For 20 minutes, the engine compartment had been flooding, putting unbearable strain on the ship's framework. Suddenly, at 2.50 a.m., the massive engines crashed through the bottom. The bow lifted up and the ship plunged down stern first. Its hull was a cavern construction which trapped air inside. When water rushed in, the superstructure burst as if mined with explosives. The force of the water smashed all her upper works. The ship went down like a house tumbling. The smokestacks tumbled across each other. There were heart-rending shrieks. First the hull sank right away taking at least a hundred souls with it. Crew member Fred Kutmeyer was trapped in the hull. The rushing waters caught me up bodily and whirled me into the engine room through the machinery. I was being drawn down in the whirlpool of the sinking steamer. Somehow I managed to clutch a piece of timber as it pushed upward. For those who survived the sinking, the nightmare was just beginning. The full force of the thunderstorm struck after the Lady Elgin went down. Flashes of lightning revealed scores of terrified people, unable to swim, climbing onto the backs of cattle, only to drown with them. The lake was strewn with wreckage, floating bodies dead and dying, which we could only see when a flash of lightning came. The sounds of prayers and curses were heard on all sides. The Elgin sank off Highland Park, but the storm pushed the survivors and the wreckage to Winnetka. The crew in the first lifeboat used their single oar like a rudder, and the wind pushed them toward the Winneka ravines. As it neared the shore, the breakers suddenly flipped the lifeboat, smashing it against the bluff. Miraculously, all 13 men on board managed to survive. They scaled the steep bluff and saw a large house, that of Jared Gage. When told of the wreck, Gage ordered his children to run and alert the neighbors. He told his coachman to build a huge fire on the beach for the survivors to see. He and the men then rode to the Winnetka train station and sent word to Chicago for help. Then they rode to Northwestern and Evanston in search of rescuers, young men who could swim. By dawn, news had spread throughout Winnetka, Glencoe, and the surrounding area. Hundreds ran from all over to see if they could help. It had been six hours since the Lady Elgin had sunk. When rescuers reached the bluff, they saw a dreadful sight. A huge swath of debris and bodies stretching all the way to the horizon. As far as the eye could see, there was nothing but human heads sticking out of the water. Then witnesses saw something equally horrific. Those who were strong enough to swim to the beach were being pulled back in by a fierce undertow. Seven times I nearly reached the shore when I was caught by a strong undertow and carried back out into the lake again. In this condition, I was tossed about in the rough waves for 13 hours. Fred Kutmeyer. The worst part came when we reached the breakers. The waves became so violent that all the people on the raft were thrown up into the air, and many drowned with the shore only a few hundred feet away. Of all those who survived the sinking of the Lady Elgin, and the long 12-mile swim to shore, over half died within a few feet of the beach from the undertow. Young men from Winnetka and Evanston, with safety ropes tied around their waists, dove in to the turbulent water to save as many people as they could. Jacob Conrad of Winnetka saved half a dozen lives until he disappeared beneath the surface. The men pulled him in by the rope and revived him. Of all the acts of heroism, none surpassed that of Edward Spencer, a student at Garrett Biblical Institute. Spencer was an expert swimmer. Despite suffering serious cuts and gashes from debris, he dove into Lake Michigan 16 times and rescued 17 people. On his last dive, he dragged in a husband and wife together. Charles Beverung, a black drummer in the German band, cut open one side of the large bass drum. Using it like a boat, he floated all the way to Winnetka's shore 
unharmed. Captain Wilson managed to crawl onto the sand, but when he saw several women with their children screaming for help, he dove back in to save them. As the captain helped the women, a wave brought a huge timber down on him, crushing his skull, and he went under. Captain Jack Wilson's body washed ashore two days later in Michigan City. Most survivors were naked, stripped of their clothing by the undertow. The majority washed up at the ravines, but a few were brought up onto Tower Road Beach. At 10 o'clock, I neared Winnetka, landing on a sand beach some distance from the bluff. I was almost naked. My back was badly cut and scraped. I found myself lying on the sand on the shore. The moment I knew I was no longer in danger, I could not move. Jared Gage's house became a kind of makeshift hospital, filled with half-dead survivors. There were a lot of priests and doctors from Chicago there. The doctors had a big jug of whiskey and they gave me a cup hole. They put salve on the cuts on my back. They gave me coffee and a slice of bread. I begged for more, but they said it would make me sick. My wife was pronounced dead until a doctor from Chicago struck the bottom of her feet with a piece of pine, thus starting the pulsation in her ankles. When Gage's house was full, survivors were brought to Peck's place, Artemis Carter's home, John Garland's, James Wilson's, and others. The dead were initially placed in the Winnetka train depot for identification before being transported to Wisconsin. Those beyond recognition, naked, headless, decayed, were buried in the Winnetka Bluff in a mass grave. But Lake Michigan was slow to give up her dead. For months, even into the following summer, bodies continued drifting ashore across four states. In Milwaukee, thieves slipped in among the mourners, pretending to be family members searching for loved ones. They picked the pockets of the dead and pulled rings off their fingers. In all, 297 bodies were recovered, 150 less than reported lost, not counting the dozens of ticketless men who jumped on board at the last minute. Of the 95 who made it to the beach, many died days or weeks later from the long hours of exposure. The wreck created 1,000 orphans. News of the disaster shocked the nation. Outrage was directed at the captain and crew of the Augusta. Although a lengthy investigation exonerated the captains of both ships, that didn't satisfy angry Irish mobs. A gang of thugs headed for the dock to burn the Augusta and kill the crew. The ship left port ahead of them. But the crew were marked men. No one would hire them. They sold the Augusta and bought a new ship called the Mojave. Exactly four years to the day of the wreck of the Lady Elgin, the Mojave was lost in a storm in northern Lake Michigan. The captain and crew the same men who were aboard the Augusta that night were all drowned. Seminary student Edward Spencer would have given his life that day. Instead, he gave his health. He became an invalid, abandoning his dream of becoming a minister. Two months after the tragedy, Abraham Lincoln won the presidency. The South rejected his election, seceding from the Union, and the nation plunged into war. The wreck of the Lady Elgin was quickly forgotten, her death toll dwarfed by the appalling loss of life on a thousand battlefields. Charles and Sarah Peck may have missed the clamor and excitement of Chicago, or maybe with their daughters grown they didn't feel the need to remain in the country, or maybe soaring property values motivated them to sell. In any event, just 12 years after they established Winnetka, they moved back to the city. For the next 50 years, Peck's place went through a succession of varied owners. The Pecks sold their beloved mansion to John Garland Jr. for $20,000. Garland sold the house to Winnetka's first millionaire, Timothy Wright, for $50,000. Wright defaulted on the mortgage. The bank in turn sold Peck's place to the wealthiest woman in America, Hetty Green. Green was known as the Witch of Wall Street, not only for her bedraggled black clothes, but for her notoriously miserly ways. Despite a fortune in excess of $200 million, about $3.6 billion in today's currency, 
She lived like a pauper in cheap boarding houses. She disdained soap and hot water as wasteful luxuries. Paranoid of being poisoned, she cooked all her own food on a portable hot plate, mostly oatmeal. When her young son skinned his knee, she refused to pay for medical treatment. The wound became infected. The leg had to be amputated. Locals waited with great anticipation for the arrival of this infamous dowager. But it was not to be. Hetty Green never set foot in Winnetka. The house was just an investment to her. Peck's place stood dormant for years, like some oversized mausoleum ensconced behind locked iron gates. The mere sight of it sent chills down the spine of most children. At last, in 1909, Green sold it to a Glencoe developer who subdivided the 11-acre property, building many of the homes that still stand on Arbor Vita. Peck's place was finally demolished in 1913. Before Charles Peck left town, he donated one square block to become the town's first public park. This seemed silly to some since all of Winnetka was like a park at the time, but Peck was convinced that one day this would not be the case and villagers would need open space. He donated the village common with strict orders that no building ever be constructed upon it, a wish that's been observed for over 150 years.